What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky with you, and uh, this is not a rerun, but it feels like a rerun. <laughs> uh, when we're talking about the Kansas City Chiefs once again hoisting the trophy. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing great, DJ. This is uh, – look, we're going to have an outstanding pie because I, I feel like the Super Bowl brings up so many things that we always talk about. I mean, even in the run-up to the game, we talked about the essentials, what you need to have to win a Super Bowl. We talked about coach, quarterback pass rush, all those things kind of played out. Uh, it was a great game to watch. It was very entertaining despite – I was for me, it was entertaining because of the defensive struggle. I know there was a lull in the game where we didn't have a lot of movement, but overall the game finished the way that we thought it would finish in terms of like two good teams really battling out and quarterbacks making big plays to win it. Okay. I, I'm. Uh, there's so many different areas we can go, of, go but the, the first thing I was going to ask you about – um, and we'll get into the intricacies of the game and some of the decision making and and everything that went on. But I was just I was watching that game last night, and I thought, you know, we're going to hear endless talk about Mahomes kind of entering into the Brady conversation as he just collected another one. He's trying to hunt down Tom Brady. Even I uh, didn't shy away from it in the post game when they asked him about it. Said, yeah, no, that's something to shoot for. You're aiming for greatness. But I was thinking about just like we we've narrowed this down to Mahomes. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, if I told you like New England. New England had a Hall of Fame coach, a Hall of yep. Fame quarterback, a Hall of Fame tight end, a Hall of Fame kicker, right? And then I'm like, okay, Kansas City, Hall of Fame head coach, Hall of Fame quarterback, Hall of Fame tight end, Hall of Fame kicker. Like everybody you need to be clutch, um, they have. And I go back to what we were talking about on the preview. We were previewing this game, and we said, look, we broke it down by position, and we and and we and coaches everything. And we said it's four to four with one push. It is a dead even game. And we said, in a dead even game, I'm going to go quarterback and I'm going to go head coach. And that was yeah. that's that was the game. That was it. That, that was that was the game. And <clears throat> I'm gonna say this, and I think everyone has to understand how different the Super Bowl is than any other game that you play in. In most games, uh halftime is 12 minutes. The Super Bowl halftime is 35 minutes, roughly. So in that game when you have all the emotions running high one i feel like kansas city was extra emotional kansas city was playing at a level they're slamming helmets travis kelsey bumps into andy reed they're yeah. barking back and forth they were just kind of out of their mind they were very similar to the way that the baltimore ravens acted that's how the kansas city chiefs acted mm -hmm. their saving grace was being able to go into halftime for 35 minutes for andy reed to go in there and be like y'all need to calm down Mm -hmm. We need to calm down and just play our game. Yes, we could make some adjustments, but from an emotional standpoint, I feel like Andy Reid's best job was done during that halftime where they got everybody down, they settled in, they figured out what they wanted to do offensively. Steve Spagnuolo did a great job of making adjustments in the second half. They went from playing zone to man-to-man. -to -man. They blitzed more zero blitzes, and they did it. And the thing to me that was telling all of their players – talked about how Spags took care of the adjustments at halftime. On offense, they talked about how Andy Reid took care of the adjustments. And in the second half, we saw a much different team. So when it goes back to coaching in these high leverage moments, man, when you got a Hall of Fame coach that has a ton of experience, that has kind of been there and done that, it's a huge advantage. And I'm going to say this. I think Kyle Shanahan did a great job calling the game. I thought he did a great job stepping in, calling the timeout on defense when he didn't like what the call was going to be. I thought he did a great job as a head coach. The difference is Andy Reid's experience as a Hall of Fame coach, to me, was was the deciding factor. And I, I go down, and you break down the minutia of this game. Um, I thought on the key third downs, if you look at Kansas City's defense, if I, and, and look, I know Snead's mm -hmm. been, he's been as good as any corner in the league, but for my money, and I've seen a lot of this team, if you ask me who their best defensive players are, I would say number one is Chris Jones, and number two is Trent McDuffie. A ball. And on, he a is unbelievable. Ball. He, a man, ball. You can find me a, a clip where he's not in phase and he's not in position. And then they third, they had the two third and fours for the Niners. That was the game, two third and fours. The Get first one, they blitz McDuffie, and he tries mm -hmm. to throw into the teeth of it, and then he bats the not ball down. down. That's it. And then on the next third and four, McKivitz, for some reason, doesn't stay big on big and kicks out and leaves Chris Jones unblocked and would have had a yeah. touchdown if if you get that yeah. protected, which I don't for the life of me. Look, I'm not I'm not an offensive line coach. There's people way smarter than me on that stuff mm -hmm. on assignments. But, I mean, 
football one on one was, hey, if I'm a quarterback, you go big on big. I'll deal with it's whatever comes off, the, off the side. And uh, they didn't. They cut him loose. So th- their two best defensive players on the two biggest third downs made plays. And then if you flip it over to the other side, even though Bosa – and mm-hmm. Chase Young were getting pressure, and, and Hargrave played good. I mean, their front played really good. On the fourth and one, chance to win the Super Bowl, Buck. Mm-hmm. Nick Bosa, for some reason, I have no idea why, he crashes on Pacheco and does not take Mahomes. Mahomes pulls it. He's got an option w- with Kelsey, but Kelsey's pretty well covered. So yeah. it's like a simple option. He can give it, he can mm-hmm. dump it to Kelsey, or he can run it. And and you were saying before we came on, the old Steve Young thing that we always talk about, like, over my dead body. That ball was going to nobody's hands but Pat Mahomes. That was going to be in his hands. And for Bosa not to have that awareness in that moment, that that for, that that cost him. That was tough. A couple of things reacting off what you said. Number one, uh, and we've talked about this and we've continued to talk about it as a theme. Uh, in big games, in key moments, think players, not plays. Mm-hmm. Who's my best player? I'll live or die with my best player taking the final You think shot. that Pacheco right. is going to be the last person to touch that ball in the Super Bowl? Ab- Absolutely no not. chance. Zero. I am going down with my best player determining my fate. And Kansas City is Pat Mahomes. And in every high leverage moment, it was Pat Mahomes making the play, whether it's his legs or putting the ball in his hands to throw it. It Just was think about think about it. Do you do you know, you know what Andy Reek? You imagine him answering questions? Hey, fourth and one, Isaiah Pacheco. Like you didn't keep the ball in the hands of the best player on the planet. Like, how does that not? I don't understand how that couldn't compute on the other side of the ball. Yeah, no, it, it has to be about the player. It has to be about who's the best player, what are they doing, all this other stuff. So in thinking about that, um, Andy Reid and those guys did a great job of making sure that their best players were in position to make those plays. The other thing, um, DJ, it's not also when you're coaching, you're not, you're not necessarily coaching against the other players. You're also coaching against the other coaches' tendencies, right? So you know – Steve Spagnuolo for a long time in terms of what he does in this league. He is an unorthodox, I'm going to bring pressure come hella high water. If I'm backed in the corner, I'm blitzing. And so you had to know that in those moments, you're going to get some kind of zero blitz. Mm -hmm. You're just going to get the pressure. Third third and fourth game on the line, I got to get you out of field goal range. I got to find a way to get off the field. They're coming. We're coming. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to do it. Every time he did that, so for me, some of that is, hey, man, you got to know not only the personnel, Chris Jones and Trent McDuffie, you just got to know the play call. The play caller is going to heat it up. And he heated them up in the second half. And to me, that was the difference. They went from playing zone to man-to-man to if we're going down, we're going down firing all the bullets. And that's what the Kansas City Chiefs do, and that's what they've done. Yeah, and I look, on the other side of it, Christian McCaffrey goes for 80 and 80. I mean, he had the fumble early on, which, you know, we'd like to have back, but that kind of canceled out with Pacheco's fumble down inside the uh, inside mm-hmm. the red zone. But Christian McCaffrey, I mean, I thought he got a lot of touches. Um, he had 22 carries. Um, he had eight catches. So you got him 30 touches. 30. I mean, I think that's that's what you wanted out of that and, one. But and you could have gotten more. And yeah. You, got you, more. you brought up a good point, though. To me, like, it, you know, and, the, and the, the the whole defense of the Chiefs played great. But to me, the story of the game was their ability to just plaster on the outside. There was nowhere to go. I mean, even the throw, Purdy was made, made some nice throws. There were not many layups. They did not give layups in that game. So um, <clears throat> in watching the game, but then also in listening to the commentary, because I love in those games when they're able to talk to the players or whatever. So uh, Nick Bolton, after the game, talked about we had to get out of zone coverage because what we were doing, we were giving them – easy windows over the middle of the field. And so he said Spags That's what he eats in. Yeah. He said Spags and then went to the back end and said, hey, guys, y'all going to have to hold up in coverage because we got to heat them up. And mm-hmm. the only way we can heat them up, we got to play man-to-man. And, you know, DJ, it's funny because I've been waffling on whether the importance of cover corners, the importance yeah. of cornerbacks in this league. We had talked about pass rush and don't worry about that. But that game brought it back to me why you need to have guys that can lock up and play man-to-man. Because, DJ, mm-hmm. if you can't play man-to-man in this league in those key moments, you can't get off the field. Mm-hmm. You can't win the game. You can't, you can't lock them up. And so people have talked about LeJarrius Sneed, but Terry McDuffie, first-round pick, played like a first-round pick, all-pro mm-hmm. player, locks it up, high IQ player, super smart player, mm-hmm. um, made the plays. You talk about always being in phase with DJ. There's something to that, not just relying on your athleticism, but relying on your – technique 
your awareness and understanding how they're able to do it. Um, you have to have those players. One other thing that we talked about when it comes to team building, I heard uh, Chris Jones and Bolton and those guys just talk about how much stuff coaches put on them. Uh, I think you told me in Baltimore, what is it? Smart, tough, fast. Physical, yeah, speed, like toughness, speed, toughness, instincts. And then, yeah, we yeah. then you add intelligence and character on there. Okay, so now we talk about smarts. So when you think about those guys that are playing in the back end for those guys, Justin Reed, mm -hmm. high IQ guy, played at Stanford, did those things. You think about Trent McDuffie, you dig in his background, high IQ guy, played at Washington, mm -hmm. like been tasked with a lot of stuff. DJ, we talk about it over and over again. It's hard to play in this league if you don't have high IQ players. You can yep. get away with one on the team, maybe. When your team is smart, it allows you to do so much other stuff. And that's what happened. You saw that play out, particularly on the defensive side of the ball for the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, and the nerve center, too. Drew Tranquil is brilliant. I mean, I know that just from being around him. I've heard great he's things about one. Nick Moulton. He's another he's one. Incredibly yes, sharp. I mean, they've got, yes. they've got sharp, sharp dudes. Um, and you know, the other thing, Buck, I think it goes back to, we talk about maturity, like kind of that secret sauce. You know, we talked about Les Snead. How did you guys get all these young players to play at such a high level right out the gate? And he said, we really locked in on mature dudes. We wanted guys that were mature, had their routine, and they could, and they were smart. So smart and maturity, I don't think those are the first two things you think of when you're evaluating players. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a pretty good track record that exists out there right now with that formula. Yeah, it, it, look, it's a really good track record. And we talk about um, – like putting it together and some of these things. And I want everyone to understand, like just because we're talking about Kansas City, it doesn't mean that San Francisco doesn't have that because we could, if San Francisco is one, we just could easily talk about the IQ of their players and how they played because uh, it was a very even Steven matchup. Hey, hey, Greenlaw getting hurt was a big deal too now. Huge deal. Yeah. It's a big, it's, it's, it was they a big factor. Burks. They went out Oren Burks. And then the other thing was they, they, you know, you talked about the man coverage stuff. I mean, when they got in key downs and they just ran mesh and they, like the 49ers couldn't, they couldn't work their way through that traffic. They couldn't navigate it. DJ, they're a team that plays 77% zone coverage. Yeah. And zone is great for keeping the ball in front and doing those things. It is too hard in this, in this game to get off the field utilizing zone coverage because you're relying on the pass rush to be able to get home with four if you zone dog, you're one man short in coverage. Can you fit the open windows when you're zone dogging? You have to be able to play man to man at times. And if you're not athletic enough or if you don't have the instincts to understand how to deal with all that stuff, it's hard. And I'll say this. A uh, man is something that you can't dibble and dabble in. Mm -hmm. you, you have to be man, all man. the way in it because there's so many little nuances and things that go along with it. It makes it hard. And the Kansas City Chiefs willingness to live in man coverage played out because they were able to take away all of the stuff that the Niners do. Cause the Niners pre-snap gimmick, gimmick, gimmick stuff. It forces you to play zone because you don't want to run around and kind of look crazy trying to chase or whatever. But the only way you can eliminate the tight, the, the open windows is you got to play man to man. That's the only way you can get the extra defender in the run game. It's the only way you can take away the layups over the middle of the field. Their ability to do that was the difference because the first the first quarter, the Niners went up and down the field. And I was worried. I was like, mm -hmm. hey, man, this, this does yeah. not look good. They do that in every, the Chiefs do that in almost every playoff game. They feel like you're in that. I mean, they've been chased, they've chased points successfully so many times, man. So that's just so, kind of been their formula. I just don't understand like how they do it. And I mean, Brock Purdy was on his game. And what you saw, and we'll get to the quarterback comparison, but what yeah. you saw is and I think two things can be true at the same time. Brock Purdy is a good player. Brock Purdy is a great player mm -hmm. in that system. But there's a difference between good and great or great and elite. Mm -hmm. the, the elite guys can go above the X's and O's in those moments. And I think Brock Purdy played about as well as he can play. But I don't think he has that extra little gear that they can lean on when everything goes awry and his receivers can't get open, that he could be dynamic and just kind of create a play. Yeah, He just doesn't have that. And to me, that's the difference between the greats and the elite. They have just that one extra superpower because I talked about the superpowers, the Avengers, right? Mm -hmm. He's Iron Man. I don't know if he has that other thing that some of the other Avengers have when we talk about Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, 
Patrick Mahomes is just a little something extra that those guys have that he doesn't have. And that's not taking anything away from how good he's been and how good he'll continue to be in San Francisco. No doubt. Um, all right, let's take a quick break. Uh, much more to get into. We'll get we'll get into the rest of this ball game right after this. Um, Buck, one thing here as a coach, I was thinking about this, and and you you're so good um, at taking the stuff that you learn from the all the different levels and applying it to your high school team. But I, I thought this was a man. This would be a great lesson for a high school coach um, who's who's starting up training camp with your with your high school team. And that if you go back and you can pull the episodes, we talked about the Kansas City Chiefs. And the teams that run these physical training camps and they practice hard and there's, it, it's hard, right? They're doing hard mm -hmm. things. Um, and uh, I was sitting there thinking, man, what a teaching lesson, right? Hey, how many times have you been out there and you're like, hey, guys, it's the fourth quarter. You know, hey, we're in overtime now. I know you guys are tired, but now we're in overtime. I'm like, this thing is darn near playing in the fifth quarter. I mean, they are down to the end mm -hmm. of overtime, a 15 minute period. Like, talk about testing your mental and physical toughness. And and you can make a case. They won this game by the work that they put in, you know, months ago, um, grinding and preparing for, for that moment. Because that's a time when people get mentally fatigued, um, physically fatigued. And when they needed to get a stop in overtime, they got the stop. When they needed to punch it in to win a Super Bowl 15 minutes into overtime, they got it done. Like, I thought that was a great lesson of, man, it's – there's no secret. There's no secret formula. You got to do hard things. You you got to do the hard things, and you got to put in the work. You do have to do, put in the work. And um, here's the thing: uh, you know, everyone understands my relationship with Andy Reid. Andy Reid was on the coaching staff in Green Bay in the mid '90s when I was a player there. I was playing defense. Andy Reid was the tight ends coach, but he was in charge of the scout team. Um, Andy Reid was working under Mike Holmgren, who came from the San Francisco 49ers, winning tradition, pedigree, everything that was talked about in that building was how you go about winning games. So fast forward, Andy Reid goes to Philly, then he goes to Kansas City. Uh, I thought what was interesting after the game, before I get to you talking about hard training camps, I don't know. So I'm looking at the end of the, the overtime, right? Mm -hmm. The clock is going down, right? Yeah. Now, well, you I know, know that rule? Because I didn't know it. So so I was I was sitting here thinking, I knew that they could go to double overtime, but DJ, I'm, I'm thinking like, is the time really a factor? Like, yeah. like is, is the time a consideration, this and that? Mm -hmm. What was interesting after the game, Pat Mahomes was talking like, because you got to remember, they snapped that ball right before the clock was set to expire. Yeah. I do wonder if the 49ers on the other end knew, like, you know how you have that that relaxed yeah. state yeah. sometimes, like, are they going to snap this or are they going to go to the next quarter? Yeah, yeah. And then they snapped it and they win it. But Pat Mahomes talked about every week someone gets up and they talk to us about situations. We have been through this overtime situation time and time and time again. So for us, there was no panic. There was nothing Very to be Belichick nervous you. about. Like we knew exactly what was coming. We knew how we wanted to prepare for it or whatever. So that's the head coaching experience. Then you talk about the hard training camps. Well, obviously I worked down in Jacksonville with Doug Peterson who came from Kansas city. He, he sat at the knee of Doug uh, at uh, Andy Reid for a long time. Hey man, we're going to put pads on. We're going to tackle to the ground. We're going to hit. We're going to do all this stuff very early in training camp, and then we'll scale it back later. But as you say, we got to get ready to do the hard things. One of the reasons Andy Reid's Kansas City Chiefs teams have always started out fast is because training camp is not club med in Kansas City. He mm -hmm. takes them out. So I forgot what cause it could. It is hot as all yeah. get out, DJ. Oh, yeah. They're out there practicing in the middle of the day under the sun. It's hot. They're physical, pads on. 24 periods, two hour practice, doing all of it. When it came down to it, to go into overtime, and you saw guys are gassed. I mean, they are gassed. DJ, I think there's something to being able to get everybody in the hotel and say, guys, we've done the hard stuff. We're ready for this moment. We know what this is going to be like. We know, hey, fourth quarter, if we got to go to overtime, whatever it takes is what it takes. They were able to do that. I think that's a great observation. And I had this conversation in a different way. I was with Mike Loxley at the East East West game. Mike Loxley is yeah. a head coach from the University of Maryland. It happened a week after Nick Saban had retired. I said, hey, man, give me like a little a little tidbit, like what you learned from Saban that is whatever. He said, Buck, he said, what I can tell you, all the great teams operate using the same formula. I was like, what do you mean? He said, it's like your grandma making chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> your grandma's not going to go to the store and get Toll House ready-made mm -hmm. She's going to do the old school work. She's going to grind it in there. She's going to stir all the stuff in there. 
Mm -hmm. The physical training camps, the old school practice methods, all of that stuff still works. And when you look at the teams that are the last one standing, they all subscribe to that theory. Whether in college, we talk about Michigan and all those other teams that play. We talk about the pros, Kansas City, San Francisco. It works. And so I know we're in this new generation where we got all the stuff, but sometimes you got to do the old school stuff to get your team ready for these moments that games are decided in Super Bowls. Yeah, no, it's uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. I mean, it, it's it's a thing that I don't think it's mentioned with them because we think about the Chiefs. We talk about the the talent. We talk about the creativity. Um, you, you think about the uh, you know the consistency that they play with. You know, their clutch. Like I don't know that we use the word grit. I don't know that we use the word tough. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we use those words enough. Like that's mm -hmm. a kind of a grimy, gritty team. This was not the formula that they've had. I tweeted out afterwards. I was like, man, look. Uh, this was the year to get him, you know, this is the year to get him and you didn't get him. And then, and then somebody wrote back and was like, how can you say that? Like their defense was, you know, the best in the league. Like they, this was not, how would you say this is the year to get him? Blah, 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 blah. It's just different. I'm like, they lost six games. They had to go on the road and win in the postseason. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. is not going to happen very often. They are going to be sitting with a bye. They are going to be playing a home game and be in the AFC championship game almost mm -hmm. every year. This mm -hmm. was the year where they had to go the hard road and they still got it done they were the most vulnerable that they've ever been this season. Mm -hmm. The most vulnerable because you were catching them coming off of winning a title uh, with a young team. The natural tendency is to kind of relax a little bit. They're still trying to figure out how to operate on offense because they went from being this aerial circus with Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey to now they're trying to kind of like manage it and ball control it and figure it out. And they did all that while their defense became the, the, the strong part of the team. Yeah. They lost six how, games, man. They lost six games. DJ, do you know how emboldened they are now after they've won the way that they won? They went on the road, knocked out all the top teams. They won a grimy, gritty Super Bowl. They have seen it all. Do you know what kind of confidence, what kind of armor they have on now when they get into the thing? Because they've done it in every situation. When we're the favorite, when we mm -hmm. got all the games at home, we won. When we were the underdog and we had to go on the road and beat everybody, We've done it. There is not a situation that they have experienced in the last five years where they haven't been able to come out on top. DJ, that is a tremendous superpower that Andy Reid can unlock with his team whenever he needs it. Yeah, you're right. They got a lot tougher to deal with the Kansas City Chiefs next year because of the success they had this year. Buck, think about this. The Baltimore Ravens lost on their defensive staff a head mm -hmm. coach that yeah. you lost a head coach that left and you lost two guys who left to be coordinators. You lost three of your, your three top, top, top guys, top yeah. guys on the defense. You look on the other side, they lost uh, some position coaches while well, the assistant offense, like some other position coaches who got jobs elsewhere. Their number two guy and the personnel side, Joe Ortiz got a GM job. So you, you, you're kind of weakening all these different areas and they didn't get to hoist the trophy. Here we go. The Kansas city chiefs, with one of those dominant defenses we've seen in, in a while, especially in the postseason, Spags doesn't even get an interview. Like he just he didn't have a successful stint. So you have all this continuity there. You don't lose him. Offensive coordinator wise, they might be getting one back. They're they're gonna EB probably add E B coming back in. Like yeah. what yeah. the heck? This is an unbelievable, unbelievable struck of, uh, stroke of luck and genius that they have this continuity here to go along with the best player on the planet. So let's think about that, right? Normally, teams always pluck from the most successful teams. Here we are talking about the Kansas City Chiefs being a dynasty and none of their coaches depart. Nobody oh. even interviews no. any of their guys. Bienemy couldn't even get a job. He, he left to take a, a, a lateral position, and now he's yeah. going to bounce right back. No one even talks about it. So we talk about that defense. Normally, when you have like one of the best defenses in football, there are people knocking at the door to get at your assistance. Nobody. Linebacker coach. My, how the my heck is your, how your buddy not got not even not, not even secondary. not does he even not, does he want to be is he interested in being a coordinator because some guys just never, like i want to be a position never, coach he never i don't he, know how he doesn't get a call he's, he's never got a call despite the, the work david Dave Merritt, Merritt, right yeah has not gotten a call about any of that so dj just think about we talk about continuity the answers to the test do you know oh. when you have a coaching staff that is able to be together for so long do you know the calm that takes place we talk about how crazy it might have been at halftime, but they're like, hey, guys, look, we've, we've been here. Look, we, we, we have so many things that we can reference 
in the mm -hmm. past where, hey, we've been here before. Let's just go do this and that. The egos that I guess have, have, have disappeared because everyone, all the pieces of the puzzle fit on the coaching staff. It's a tremendous advantage that they're all together. And so, DJ, you're right. And everyone's like, oh, we're going to get them this year. How? How are no. you going to get them when no. the young guys are getting better? They may move off of the Jerry Sneed, but have other people yeah. ready. Buck, we talked, we talked at the top about the New England comp, right? We talked about Hall of Fame, coach, quarterback, tight end, kicker, all that stuff. How about how about the continuity? And they would say, oh, well, people left in New England. The offense stayed the same. And guess what? When Josh McDaniels didn't work out, he came back. Yeah. You look at what happened when Bill O'Brien didn't work out, he came back. Nagy didn't work out for the Chiefs, he comes back. EB doesn't work out, he's probably coming back. Like the structure, it's the same. They just keep building and building and building and building. So you're like, who the heck's gonna have a chance to take these guys down? Well, I know one thing. If I'm like this, if I'm like the Cincinnati Bengals and you have a down year here or there, you better think twice about making a coaching change because I want to keep Joe Burrow and Zach Taylor together as long as we can so we mm -hmm. can keep building and not have to go all the way back down to the bottom. The Chargers have been kind of they've been kind of in a mess with this because Justin Herbert keeps getting new voices and new people every single year. I think they're hoping with Jim Harbaugh, now you can start building that. But you're you're four years behind. Like Mahomes has been in the same thing for six years. And he's figuring it out. He's only getting better. And I will say this. One of the reasons for the Baltimore Ravens' success has been the continuity and the consistency in terms of everything that goes on in that building. So they haven't been able to close the gap and catch them. So now you're talking about the, the flux that their defense may be in as they're trying to adapt and adjust to newness, new coaches, mm -hmm. new tweak on the scheme that they're doing. Kansas City gets to stay there. I thought what was interesting, Andy Reid talked about Texting with uh, Antonio Pierce uh, this week, just talking about how he thanked them for that tail mm -hmm. kicking they got on Christmas Day because it woke them up. Players and coaches, and they kind of found their way to go into it. Um, Nick Saban always talks about never waste a failure. Mm -hmm. The Kansas City Chiefs were able to take a failure and become a better team. And the only way you can do that is you got to be very honest with yourself on who you are, what you are, and what you are about. And they were able to do it. And I think it's interesting that you point out this thing about I never thought about like the continuity or the, the, the thing with the parallels with the Patriots in terms of head coach, quarterback, tight end, kicker. I think that's interesting. I don't know what is there, but I just think about like, look, we know the brain trust, the head coach and the quarterback, the tight end, though. We always talk about winning games. You got to dominate the middle of the field. Yeah. The tight end is the easiest weapon to utilize over the middle of the field. It's you the know, best matchup on the field. It's the most advantageous matchup. The best the matchup you're going to get there. And then the nails kicker. Because mm -hmm. let's talk about this because of special teams. So great coaches understand all three phases. Offense, defense, special teams. The Kansas City Chiefs blocked the PAT. Mm -hmm. They got a turnover on a botch Blunt. return. It, it bounced off somebody's leg. He tried to pick it up, didn't get it. Turnover. DJ, Which was a touchdown the next play. Next play. And remember, Kansas City was scuffling on offense. They couldn't no. get anything going. And you gifted them a touchdown opportunity. I, I just think it's the great coaches and great teams, they win in the hidden areas, the areas that maybe some teams are like, ah, you know what, we're good. We don't need to work on that today. We don't need to talk about, but like we're good on special teams. The great teams spend a little extra team. And everyone has always talked about this, especially because they took talk about being able to win that area they dominate in special teams and it showed up in a key moment in the super bowl yep and i also would say you know give uh brett veach who i was with in philadelphia a lot of credit as well because when you think about it buck when you when you pay the quarterback then you mentioned it like the margins like you have to pay attention to everything in other words you are churning the roster the bottom of the roster hey nicole hardman wasn't even on their team to start the season but you're always monitoring, how do we get better? How do we get better? We can't do it, you know, with the high-ticket items. Well, he's not – the Jets don't want him. Well, we can we can use him. Like, we another, can use another, him here. another example of, we'll bring you back. Come on in, but come, come on back. back. Come, come, yeah. come, 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 Doesn't work out over there? Come on home. We'll, yeah. we'll bring you back. DJ, mm -hmm. as crazy as that is, oh, man, that's fine. No hard feelings. Like, either way, yeah. like, we're good. We're, we'll bring you back. You know what it is. You know what the program is. Maybe you have a greater appreciation for the program now that you've been elsewhere. Mm -hmm. 
I think there's I was a trying to think of other guys that. that they've had. Who am I? Who am I thinking of with the Patriots? Because the Patriots had some players go away, not have success, and then come right back in. Well, I mean, obviously it didn't work out with J.C. Jackson last year, but they've had they've had other guys. I was trying to think of who it was. Uh, who was the linebacker that was there that went to Cleveland and then came back? Um, um, wasn't Max? It wasn't was Hightower. It? No, who who they had? Uh, they've had a few different guys that they brought back. Oh, oh, uh, I can think. I can see him now. Big, tall, athletic uh, linebacker. Was I can't think it was Chris right now. Was the Christian Carrot? It was somebody they brought back last year. They they oh, Jamie a few. Collins. Jamie Collins. Jamie Collins came back. Right. Nice job, yeah. Bill. Good pull. Yeah. Um, it, it, I feel like yeah. there's been other guys too who have left and have secondary, found their way back. Yeah. Secondary guys that come back that kind of understand the program, join, jump right back in. Mm -hmm. and like, DJ, I think, but I think what that does is that speaks to the organization and the structure of the program. You know exactly what you're getting. Like there, there are no secrets when it comes to when you come here. Here's the expectation. Here's what we deal with. And all that other thing. I think it's important, though. I, I do want to touch on this um, because you've been with Andy and they've had a lot of success drafting guys that may have been edgy. I won't all the way call them characterists, mm -hmm. but they've, they've done a good job of taking guys that were kind of on the fringes from a character standpoint. And they've been able to have them. I think the interaction that you saw last night between Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid. When Travis Kelsey was coming out of Cincinnati, there were some questions mm -hmm. about his character and stuff coming out of the University of Cincinnati. But in Kansas City, he not only has developed into a Hall of Fame tight end, he's one of their best players. He's a leader for the team. But you saw emotions running hot. And we've seen it a few different times this offseason where he's thrown his helmet. He's done that stuff. But Andy Reid has been able to kind of rein him in. Working side by side with Andy Reid, what can you give us on – the character thing and how that fits into like what either disqualifies a player or what is it about some guys who have like fringe character that he's been okay. Cause he did it with Michael Vick and he's done it with others. How is he able to get those guys on board? Well, and it's the phrase that, you know, as we've talked about it for years, it's, it's the difference between character and football character. So, mm -hmm. and for people that listen though, what, what character is character? Well, football character means I love, football i am passionate about football i work at football i've had other issues around that have that have got me in some trouble and i haven't done things the way i should do them but at my core i have a passion and a love for football and what the belief that andy has is if that's so if football is that important to you then we're going to relay that message to you that man if we don't clean up some of this other stuff you're going to lose what you love and what you're passionate about and they channel that and then that's why like even guys that um people say like attitudes like deshaun mm -hmm. jackson was you know he, he had you know yeah. his attitude wasn't great deshaun jackson loved football he loved to practice he loved to compete um and then andy's like he sees that he's like oh those are the guys i want i mean those are the guys that i want that are passionate about this game and that love ball not guys who just want to make a bunch of money and i just happen to be real athletic and real talented but i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna show up when i need to be there i'm gonna leave as soon as i can like that's not that's different now that's not what he's looking for so it's great that you brought it up because they asked him about that in post game about the interaction with travis kelsey and the first thing he said He's like, I mean, he's just a great player that wants the ball. Like, he just was yeah. frustrated he hadn't got the ball. But that's not mm – -hmm. I think D DJ, he was dismissive of it. Like, yeah, I mean, he, he wanted the ball. Like, okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. Like, I'm okay with all of the energy and all of that other stuff. At his core, good football players want the ball. My job is like, oh, okay, he made me aware. So now I just got to make sure that I want to be involved. So when you talk about guys that love it. So he is. it's easy for him to look at Travis Kelsey, who's working hard, who's done all this other stuff, to be like, Oh, okay, yeah, that's just him expressing to me, coach. Yeah. I can, I can do more. I can, and you notice in the second half, he did a lot more. They yep. gave him, they gave yep. him more opportunities, yep. and he did it. I just think the underrated part of being a head coach is understanding your players and understanding how to manage the different personalities. I give this person this part, but I give this other person something else. I can handle all of these things because the football character is right. I got to get them to clean up. Yeah. All the stuff. Some behave, maybe some behavioral stuff we can clean up. But if they love ball, oh, I can, I can tap into that. And he's had a lot of success doing that with Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, Michael Vick, and the list goes on and on and on when it comes to it.
you know, the interesting thing is a lot of times the guys who display their passion on the field and it comes in ways of it might be anger. It could be guys that are emotional. You've seen guys that cry, um, all those things. But a lot of times when you when you get that person away from the field and you ask him this question, hey, tell me about your week. Tell me about your preparation. The guys who the guys who are that passionate, that emotional are the guys who put the most into it and have the most on the line. You know, the guys who walk off the field and shrug their shoulders, the guy who didn't do anything extra that no. does. not I mean, you can have that guy like that's my whole thing. Like and we'll see. Like, I know mm -hmm. I won't get off on a tangent, but like I know we're getting mm -hmm. ready to enter into Caleb Williams season and we're going to hear people go on and on about him crying after after a game that he lost and he was up there with his mom in the stands and he was crying. I've seen people try and, and, and pick mm -hmm. that apart. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting here going, I don't know. I, from my time in personnel, I don't know where you think, Buck. I'll take a guy who cares. I don't care. I, I'd rather have a guy who's throwing something or crying with his mom than the guy who shrugs his shoulders and just walks off the field. That, that's that's my take on that. Uh, look, man, there's a, <laughs> there's a difference in liking it and loving it. I want mm -hmm. people to absolutely love it. And at that position that we're going to talk about with Kayla Williams and quarterback, you got to love it. You can't fake your way through it. You have to be 100% committed to the game. That's the only way you can be successful at it. When you listen to Pat Mahomes, there is no doubt in our minds that Pat Mahomes absolutely loves the game. I think it was eye-opening for us when we brought him into the studio and had him on the pod. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was right after like we had done the rankings and, and the other stuff. And you're like, man, if I'd only talked to him I before wish, we submitted I wish I could have. Yeah. But his ability to convey and articulate what he's doing, his um, ability to clearly tell us his plan and his process throughout the week, getting ready for the game. His recall of mm -hmm. games. And I mean, I remember you asking him about a play at TCU and he was like, oh, you're talking about the one down in the right corner where I did that, 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 that. Yep. He was able to do it. As we get down the road, when it comes to the players, we talk about hits and misses. DJ, it, it is rare that you miss on someone who absolutely loves the game. The ones that we typically miss on are the ones that just didn't have the interest, didn't have the level of commitment that is required to play at a high level in this game. Last last thing here as we're uh, we're wrapping this up. I was flashing back at the end of that game. You remember when uh, Kadarius Tony lined up offsides and they had the play called back, which would have been an unbelievable winner against Buffalo in the regular season. And after the game was over, people got after Mahomes a little bit. He took some heat because after the game, he went up to Josh Allen and said, that's the worst call I've ever seen or something. He complained. Instead of like just congratulating Josh Allen and kind of moving on, he, it was eating him alive that that play got called back. And uh, and some people hit him, and I'm like, you know what? No, I think that's kind of th – those guys are wired different, man. Like, that was personal. Like, him losing that game was personal to him. Every and he couldn't hide it. He couldn't hide it. He could, And even though him and Josh Allen are buddies, and I'm sure, you know, he there's a lot of respect there, but he was like, nah, hey, I didn't lose that game. Like, that didn't that didn't happen. Like, it was, uh, was kind of telling when you look back on it. It's telling. And I think the other thing is telling, like, there has been this shift over the Kansas City Chiefs where they went from being kind of like the feel good story. Everyone loved how they played. It was fun as hip to now they've kind of become the villain. They are now the evil empire. Yeah. And Pat Mahomes was asked about it in the run up to the Super Bowl. And he was like, look, man, I ain't never really worried about being the villain. I don't really care about that, but I like winning. And so if I'm going to keep, I want to keep winning. So if you don't like me because I win, then. That's whatever, you because come, I'm, yeah, on you. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm going to keep winning. DJ, I think there's something to that. Like we talk about winners win and, and, and just understanding everything that comes along with it. I think I want to ultra competitive people. I want people mm -hmm. that are just competitive. And if my QB1 is like that, it just makes for the rest of the team to be like that. I want, I want to ask you one thing, because I'm curious on yeah. your opinion. Um, so Chris Jones is up and they have to make a decision on yeah. Chris Jones yeah. and Larry Sneed and those things. And Chris Jones, after the game said, I went up to Clark Hunt and said, Hey man, we got some special broom. We need to work this thing out because we can do a lot more winning. When you look at the Kansas City Chiefs off season things and the number one thing, would you try and find a way to get this thing done with Chris Jones? Even if it means letting LeJerry Sneed walk. I think I would prioritize, uh, Chris Jones and that, I mean, uh, Snead's as good as it gets at corner. Um, I think it's, I think it's easier. And I say that not knowing it's not easy, but it's easier to go try and find someone to take over for, for Snead. I, I don't know. You're going to find anybody to take over for Chris Jones. And to the point where I was going to spin it around and ask you if is Chris Jones is, could he be Charles Haley? 
You remember when Charles Haley was the Niners yeah. and just him going to the Cowboys? That was the yeah. that was the difference. Dion Dion did the same mm-hmm. thing, right? You know, like that mm-hmm. that the almost look at it and say, man, the one player like if Chris Jones went to Cincinnati or Buffalo, mm-hmm. is that the one move that could flip the tide inside the conference? Like, is he? I, okay, I so think he a, might be that good. Like, that could be the one player who could dominant. be that guy. He's a dominant player. He he's all this, and it's so funny, man, because I had this thing like. DJ, did he have a bad rap coming out of Mississippi State? Did he have some stuff around there him? There was some stuff, but it wasn't anything. Uh, it was, it was, wasn't. It was, okay. No, yeah. no. Oh, okay, because because I'm sitting here, and when I hear him, man, he's so articulate in terms of being yeah, able to just express like, yeah. like what he is another. like. So I, wanted, I, I would say this. I know he's like 30. I would always prioritize someone up front versus a back-end guy. But also, given their success developing young players and this draft class, I look would what bank. they've done with these DBs. Look at look at would, what your boy would, has done with these yeah. DBs, man. I would, I would bank on uh, we can develop a young corner. And yeah. they probably are. But remember, because they drafted so many, they've had guys that are working in. Oh, yeah. There's someone that can. Williams. They got other yeah, guys. They, can, they got someone that can, talented. That, can, that, that can step up and, and play that. So, yeah, I, I, I just wonder because it's going to be expensive. Yeah, you keep him. But I wouldn't want. I would, and my my thing is, it's one thing of him walking out the door. It's another thing if he walked out the door to one of your major competitors. Play against him. Yeah, you don't want to play against him. You don't want to play against him. It's going to be interesting because I think. Uh, well, I think that Baltimore will probably tag Matt at BK would be my guess. Who uh, yeah. is coming off he, a monster he year? He can't. He, he can't, can't leave either. Yeah, and let him. Yeah, like I just think it. I think it's something. It's something to that. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating discussion. What they have to do with him? They need to. Um, eventually find someone to be heir apparent to Travis Kelsey mm-hmm. because he's on the, he's on the downside, but um, you need to have somebody there, but I, man, it's hard for me to say that this team is going to take a major step back when they have number 15 in the head coach. <laughs> like as long as those two guys wow. are there, they're always going to be a viable contender. And man, that division, you know, we talk about your chargers, that division, that division, that division is going to be a smoker now. Cause you, you not only have a good teams, but now you got coaches. Yep. I mean, Sean Payton, Sean, Jim Harbaugh, uh, AP's AP, got I mean, the Raiders playing hard. Yeah. No, and that's the other thing, too, is it's, um, you know, Brady went on that long run where that division was garbage uh, for a long, for a big portion of his time there. And I think, look, the AFC West has been dominated by the Chiefs. There's been some, some good uh, opposition at times. It feels like that's going to get better uh, over the next few years. Yeah, because you got to make them work during the regular season. Like, that's yeah. the other thing, too. Like, they've been able for a long time, not this year, but they've been able to skate through um, the regular season to get the number one seed. Yeah, you got to make them work. But it's great. Uh, anything about the Niners? Because I feel like we kind of left them. Any, anything quickly about any no, thoughts? No, I mean, them? I think we hit on, we hit on uh, you know, defensive front. I thought played well. I don't think they had the corners to, to, to do what you had to do in that game, which is to man those guys up and challenge them. And I, I thought in the key moments they couldn't do that. And then I thought the Greenlaw injury was huge. You look at Mahomes, what he did, you know, he had, what, 59 yards rushing in the second half uh, yeah. with Greenlaw not you there. Know, that was, yeah, that's the middle of the field. They took advantage of that. So that was a big part of it. I think, look, uh, Hufanga, you know, you know, getting hurt and missing yeah. the majority of the year. Uh, Jair Brown played well. He had a bunch of tackles. Mm-hmm. and He's a good player. But I thought they missed him a little bit. I think that, you know, they're gonna have to, uh, you know, Ayuk's a good is a good route runner, but they're gonna have to find somebody else too. I think I feel like they need another guy who can win one on one. Man, I think I think that's the thing that that steps up. And I didn't want to get off the pod without talking about that. I think the one thing we've talked about the successful receivers that dominate in the league, they're craftsmen. And I would say the one area where the Niners might be lacking out wide, I don't know if they have a a, a route running specialist in the fold. Ayuk may be the best of their crew when it comes to running routes. I don't know if they have that guy that can, hey, man, I'm going to leave you one-on-one, you get open. A Justin mm-hmm. Jefferson type or whatever, like just using Justin Jefferson as a visual. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the next step for them. They have to find someone who can win in that area because the Super Bowl was a game where they needed someone, hey, you giving us man coverage? This guy's going to absolutely wear you out. You can get out that man-to-man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the evolution. That's the next step. Cal Shanahan finding his Julio Jones on the perimeter. What he had in Atlanta, that one guy that hey, I'm a I'm a lineup and I'm a throw it to him. Ben Ayuk had 1300 yards, so it's hard to complain about that. Mm-hmm. But one other guy that in these moments they can really lean on 
to get open consistently to get man coverage. And we talked about this was the year to get the Chiefs. This might also have been the year for the 49ers because, to me, when you look around the landscape, the Lions are coming. The Green yeah. Bay Packers and their youth, uh, they're going to get better. You know, the Eagles are maybe aging a little bit, and the news came out that Hassan Reddick's probably going to get traded. They might be coming back down, but I feel like those other two teams, um, man, mm-hmm. that's uh, it's not going to be a cakewalk for the 49ers. This was kind of their year to get this thing done, man. Yeah, it was their year, and it's going to be tough because the Rams are only going to get better, even though they have changed. And you're going to eventually have to pay the quarterback here too. Yeah, you're going to have to pay him. You're going to have to pay him a hefty chunk of the pie, mm-hmm. and that's going to change how you, you build the rest of the team. And so all of the luxuries that you enjoyed with the extra money that you were saving from the quarterback, that have to be redistributed, and the draft will be a big part of it. Their ability to draft and develop players, particularly on the defense side of the ball, will kind of come into focus as they have to pay Brock Purdy big money. Yep, and uh, and shoot, we talked about not winning at all and having attrition. They lost, you know, Adam Peters, um, who was number two in command on the yeah. personnel side. So again, the Chiefs. I don't know how they did it, Buck. They win the whole thing. They don't lose any coaches. They don't lose anybody in the personnel department. Just keep it rocking and rolling, man. It's good to right. be a Chief. It it is. Chiefs Kingdom is very excited about what is what is taking place, and they should be excited about what's to come because it looks like there may be some more hardware in the future. Uh, no doubt. Uh, by the way, it is uh, it is draft season now. We are officially in it. Uh, this is going to be the place to be too because we're going to have uh, pods coming your way uh, every week, multiple pods where we'll be diving into the, the players. We're going to do more. I've got some feedback on this. We're going to do more on the teams as well. So we talk so much about prospects. We're going to talk about what these teams need uh, as we head towards free agency, as we head towards the draft. So hopefully uh, you'll join us on that ride. Uh, anything else you want to add before we get out of here? No, nah, man. Great, great part. I enjoy these conversations when we have an opportunity to really dive deep, not necessarily just talk about the X's and O's of the game, but some of the, the thoughts and philosophies behind some of the decisions that are made in terms of building these teams and kind of getting it together so you can be a championship squad. No doubt. Um, I enjoyed it as well. Um, all right, everybody, we appreciate you. And we'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks.